Hey. Oh, hi. Calling Chris Anderson in London. I'm I'm still in London. Well, not really, but by the time you see this, I yeah. anyway. Yes, I'm in London. Calling Chris Byron, Chicago. <laughs> I'm I'm in Chicago. I, 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 so, I, so where will you be as people are watching this? Time well, shift I, for me. Where are you I'm, right now? Uh, I'm in Paris right now. And, uh, I'm with uh, some friends, uh, Hugh McDonald Buchanan, who some of you may know. Uh, Hugh uh, McDonald Buchanan. Yes, we're going to be doing some site inspection work for a uh, French Revolution uh, trip uh, sometime in the future. And also, I'm going to be there checking out uh, sites uh, relating to the German occupation of Paris during World War II. So, oh, fantastic. I, I, so, I won't be in front of the camera next week. And where are, we, are you going to be in Chicago? I am actually probably going to be skiing. Wow. I'm probably skiing right now. You're probably skiing. Well, hopefully you don't probably break a leg. This is, well, it's kind of <laughs> just kidding. I, I don't even oh, have a okay. gesture for cross-country skiing. Welcome, everybody. Did you get confused about where you'd come? This is History Happy Hour brought to you with really? the help of Stephen Ambrose, Historical Tours. And Chris, many other nice people. We have tours in where? Europe. The U.S. and you know you can go to the South Pacific and Iwo Jima and places like right. that. And yep. You can check it all out at stephenambrosetours.com. And whether yes. you're watching live wow. or watching a replay or listening on the HHH podcast, thank you so much for joining us. And today we're going to be presenting an encore episode about privateers in the American Revolution. And Chris, can you say a thank you to our, our Patreon subscribers, patrons? Well, of course. We can't thank them enough. It wouldn't be possible if we didn't have all these folks who, who make this show possible. So, um, And all the I'm others who be... aren't top shelf patrons no, no, but yeah. still patronize. Theirs. Anybody who takes the time to. We love patronizing support. people. <laughs> <laughs> and please also subscribe to our YouTube uh, channel and Facebook channel. It makes us feel so good. Yes. Validation it makes us feel good. so good. And tell everybody what you're drinking. Even if we're not here looking at this, everybody else still wants to know where you are and what you're drinking. So please put it down there. And with that, Chris, do you think we're in a position that we can um, we can start this baby? Well, I know you're like waiting for the chair left. Is it ready to take you up the hill now? No, uh, that's not how this kind of skiing works. Oh, it gets it. All right, you sorry. ski oh, yes. uphill. Yes. You ski uphill. That doesn't seem like a lot of fun. But anyway, well, here you go. <laughs> The bar is open. The bar is open, and today we are focusing on the forgotten story of American privateers during the Revolution, daring freelance captains whose high seas adventures were a much more important part of the war than uh, history seems to remember. And our navigator on this journey today is Eric J. Dolan, author of the new book, Rebels at Sea, Privateering in the American Revolution. And Eric uh, hails these days from the uh, seafaring town of Marblehead, Massachusetts, and that is where he is joining us from today. Eric, greetings. Welcome Hi, to History thanks. Happy Hour. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So, so you. here's a, your cocktail check. Did you do? What do you have? Some rum or grog or what did you bring? No, with I don't you? have. I'm not. I'm not much of a, a hard liquor drinker, <laughs> uh, unfortunately or fortunately. But I do love. I do love beer, and I'm drinking. Uh, Ipswich Ale. Oh. Pilsner, my a good friend of mine is the head brewer at Ipswich Ale, so I'm trying to I'm doing a commercial for him at the same time. Excellent. But, could you talk uh, to uh, him about sponsoring History Happy? Hour? <laughs> I think this could be just the thing for Ipswich okay. Ale to really ramp up their sales. It's always good to have friends who are brewers. That that's yes, definitely that's very good. Yeah. Uh, Chris, how about you? Are you are you uh, with a cocktail today? Again, that great British invention, gin and tonic in a can. Gin and tonic in a can. It's like Prince Albert, but not quite the same thing. Uh, Eric, um, we, well, let's stop fooling around and get down to some serious history. Uh, and your book uh, is about privateering in the American Revolution. And I think uh, some of us may have an idea, right or wrong, about what privateers really are. But maybe you can start with some context and say, what exactly are privateers? And yep. on what scale did they operate during the American Revolution? Okay, uh, privateers are armed vessels that are outfitted uh, by private individuals, and they have government permission to attack enemy ships during times of war. Uh, that permission came in the form of a letter of marque 
which was a formal legal document that laid out the roles and responsibilities of the privateers. And what would happen is if a privateer went out and captured a British ship or a neutral ship capturing British munitions that were going to the Navy or the Army, the ship would be brought back into port. There'd be a trial to determine whether or not it was a, a valid prize. And if it was a valid prize, the ship and the cargo would be sold in an auction. And the proceeds from that auction would be split evenly between the owners of the privateer and any investors, and then the men who fought on board the privateer. So it was a way to make money during the American Revolution, but as I argue quite strenuously in the book, most privateersmen were patriots as well. Just like almost everybody else that was involved in the war, there was a profit motive involved, and there was a patriotic element as well. And as to how much of an impact they had, it was quite substantial. There were nearly 2,000 wow. privateers during the American Revolution. On board, those privateers were roughly 20 to maybe as high as 40,000 men. There, there is some difficulty Jeez. in counting the numbers. But, uh, and they captured about 2,000 British prizes. So uh, one way of looking at it is that privateering was probably either the largest or one of the largest industries during the American Revolution. And uh, we can get into it a little bit more, but there are a whole variety of ways in which privateers really took it to the British and had an influence on the war. So, I mean, one of the things that really struck me about the book is I had no idea of the scale of this until I got in it. I mean, this is a huge part of the war. And yeah. aside, aside from kind of the monetary aspect of it, what are some of the, I guess, other impacts of the, that this had on the war? I mean, is it well, just about money or is it is there something more to this? than? Oh, no, it's about a lot more than money. I mean, money was one of the prime motivators. But basically, the privateers took it to the British and made them bleed. Insurance rates, maritime insurance rates in England skyrocketed. Uh, the uh, impact of the privateers taking so many British ships uh, led to a war weariness among the British. Uh, privateering activities, because France was very involved and very supportive of American privateering, privateering in a very real sense contributed to uh, bringing France into the war on the side of the Americans. And on the domestic front, the cargoes and ships that were brought in by the privateers helped with the local economy. The outfitting of privateers really gave a boost to local economies as well. Local fortunes were created. The money that privateersmen brought home, uh, of course, through the economy, helped their families. Uh, so there were a whole bunch of ways. There was a a Pennsylvanian who wrote in 1779 uh, that without the goods that were brought in by the numerous privateers, that he felt that America could not have sustained the war against the British. And in the Caribbean, where privateers were particularly impactful, they captured just up through 1778, 250 British ships. Mm -hmm. And the amount of trade between England or Great Britain and their sugar colonies in the Caribbean plummeted by 66%. And this was deemed such an alarming number that Earl uh, Suffolk in Parliament urged his fellow parliamentary parliamentarians not to make data like this public because it would <laughs> basically reflect on the weakness of the nation. So there's a whole suite of ways in which privateering impacted the war. Uh, there are also some more horrific ways in which it impacted the war, and that's through the number of privateersmen who were captured, with so many men going to sea. A number of them were captured, and they were put into prisons. The most horrific prisons were the prisons in New York City, the prison ships like the Jersey. On board the Jersey, 11,500 prisoners died during the war, probably 90% of them were privateersmen. So we can't only look at the positive side of privateering. It also had 
a major impact on our country in terms of death. And when you compare that to the number of men who died in the direct line of fire, which was only between about 4,000 and 7,000, you get an idea of the magnitude of the suffering that privateers went through. But on the flip side, that suffering was well known to Americans and was a cause of great concern. And actually, I believe, and I think the evidence bears this out, that the information that Americans had about what would happen if you were captured at sea actually encouraged Americans on board, privateersmen, as well as Continental Navy ships to fight more fiercely yeah. to avoid getting captured. Yeah. So, um, Eric, first of all, I want to compliment you. I think you just answered the next four questions on my list uh, today. Um, so the show may run a little short, but uh, no, no, no. We'll, 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 we'll come up with something to, uh, to else to ask you. One of the so while we're talking about sort of the overall impact of, uh, of privateers, uh, one of the things that I found fascinating in your book is that privateering is very much a, uh, a business opportunity for people and not just for the people who are, you know, who own a ship and are going to outfit it or for the, uh, or for the privateersmen, which is the word you use to describe the sailors and officers on these ships, but it's a business opportunity for anybody who wants to invest. And just like on Wall Street today, there's all sorts of ways to invest. You know, you can buy, you can, you can have side bets and futures and kind of all sorts of things. Maybe they're not calling them that, but tell us a little bit about that. No, you're absolutely right. It, it, it's not quite like the Bitcoin frenzy, but there was a speculative <laughs> frenzy within the colonies because these privateers went out and there was an expectation that they would succeed. That was the, that was the hope and maybe not the expectation. But people could invest in the privateer directly. George Washington invested in, pri in at least one privateer, appropriately enough, called the General Washington. <laughs> uh, Paul Revere invested in privateers. Generals Knox and Green invested in privateers. Unfortunately, uh, General uh, Nathaniel Green, there are a couple of letters in the book that attest to his relative failure in picking winners, he kept saying, you know, basically, why isn't Lady Luck on my side? Because a lot of the privateers that he invested in didn't come back with prizes. So you can invest in the privateer itself, but you can also invest in the privateersmen, the men on board. You could buy a portion of their share. Let's say that a man on board was due uh, one, you know, one share of the profits of the cruise. You could buy half of the share. You could give them an upfront payment of 70 pounds, perhaps sterling or uh, whatever other continental money if you had it. And then if they came back, you would get a percentage of their profits. So it could work really well if your privateer, the one that you pick, the horse that you pick, came back with a whole bunch of prizes. However, it could be a total failure if they were captured at sea. And there's a great story I tell in the book, or I think it was interesting, about this one privateersman who went to sea and he gave his mother the power of attorney while he was away. And while he was away, she sold half of his shares, essentially, half of, sold half of the value of her son's privateering expedition for 70 pounds. And this woman used that, the mother used that, to pay for feed for her cows, to support the rest of her family during a very trying time. And then when uh, her son, William uh, Sherburn, Andrew Sherburn came back, his privateer was unsuccessful. So the man that had put up the 70 pounds was out 70 pounds, but his mother made out like a bandit during her son's cruise. So you have it on both sides. People, it's sort of like gambling, like going into a casino. You never quite know what's going to hit. You try to make your bet as best as possible by picking a ship that is well, uh, you know, ha has a lot of armaments on board, has a good amount of men on board, is is led by a captain who hopefully has a good track record. And throughout the course of the war, more and more captains got known for their positive track records as privateersmen. So uh, you, you tried your best. You tried as best you could to pick a winner, but an awful lot of privateers, unfortunately, were losers, but a lot of them were winners. 
there's one in particular, the Hulker out of Philadelphia that had over the period of four years had 11 captains. And during one cruise, they captured 10 British prizes, very large, fat British merchantmen, brought them back into Philadelphia, sold them for a whopping two million pounds. And Blair McClanahan, who was the owner of the Hulker and a bunch of other privateers, was known as the, the millionaire maker during the war because quite a few of his captains and other men would come back with a load of money. I mean, there were, there were ships that would come in and an average man on board, sort of the man before the mass, the, the, the sailor, could make 5,000 pounds. When you compare in 1776, an average uh, captain of a merchant ship might make 82 to 100 pounds a year. So, uh, and a laborer, a common laborer, might make 40 pounds a year. So if you're going to come back and you're going to make 5,000 pounds or 1,000 pounds or 500 pounds, it is a great incentive to put your life on the line. And that's what these guys were doing. I mean, they had guts to go out there, even during times when there is no war, to go out in a ship in the open ocean in the late 1700s involved a lot of guts. And just like fighting in the Continental Army, fighting in the Continental Navy was a dubious proposition. You could die going to sea at a time when there were not only British naval ships, but also British privateers that were on the lookout for American privateers. It was really a scary time. And I often think, what would I have done if I had been alive during the American Revolution? Would I have fought for my country to be? I like to think that I would have. I don't know which service I would have entered, but I got to tell you, it is much easier to be a writer than it is to be a practice <laughs> or to here. be a, a military. Well, you know, one of the, uh, there's lots of really fascinating insights in, in the book and things I, I hadn't thought of, but one of the things that really struck me, you have a, you, you talk about John Adams, and he says, uh, he called the Mass, Massachusetts Act of November 1st, 1775, one of the most important documents in history, and the Declaration of Independence a Brimborian, which I'm mispronouncing, or, I'm or sure. A trifle, yeah. Yeah, if this is so... Why have we? What is the Massachusetts Act, and why haven't we heard about it? And maybe you could use that as a way to explain how the colonies get to the point where they're going to declare this privateering war on Great Britain. And, and maybe you can tell us right. more about the word Brimborian. Yes, that's just a great I, I word. I had to look up Brimborian. Brimborian is just French for trifle. You know. So he's saying so insignificant so, thing. Saying compared so, so to the so Declaration that, of Independence, right? That that's a trifle it, compared to this right. Massachusetts Act. Right. I I think John Adams actually got it right during the time, not in, not throughout history. I think since then, the Declaration of Independence is slightly more important. His only point was, and this was, he wrote that 40 years after the American Revolution. His point was that Massachusetts took the leap first. They established the first privateering law on November 1st of 1775, and that spread to other colonies like Rhode Island and New Hampshire, and then finally the Continental Congress in March of 1776 decided that we shouldn't do privateering in a piecemeal fashion, but we should have it colony wide, you know, continental. So I think John Adams point was that privateering had a major impact on the outcome of the war. And the fact that Massachusetts went first, it sort of generated this impulse that radiated out through the rest of the colonies and ultimately up through the Continental Congress. So that's the point that he's making. Uh, I don't want to disparage the Declaration of Independence. I think that over the last 200 and some odd years, I would probably weight it a little bit more importantly than the uh, privateering. You resolution. dare to disagree <laughs> with John Adams? <laughs> well, he's Who do you think today. you are? He probably, he probably agree with me too. Well, but, I, um, you know, I, he had, he did have some issues with Thomas Jefferson, so I wondered yeah. if this was just more of, of, of John Adams pouring a little uh, uh, gasoline on that fire. It, it, it could have been. But to go back to your original question, why did this all come about? It was basically at the beginning of the war, after the battles of Lexington and Concord, and then the Battle of Bunker Hill, the colonies were still not sure they wanted to break free of Britain. But what was clearly happening is Britain was clamping down on the colonies, in particular, Massachusetts and the New England colonies. So the Continental Congress in the summer of 
1775 sent out a letter to the colonies basically telling them to defend themselves. And Massachusetts, who had a lot of experience with privateering from the war of the Seven Years' War or the French and Indian War, they had a lot of their merchant ships were laid up because of British clampdown. They had tons of mariners, fishermen and sailors who were put out of work. So they had a huge potential workforce that could go on these privateers. They knew that privateering was an effective means of attacking an enemy. So they leapt first and then they were followed by others. And of course, I'm sitting here in Massachusetts. I'm sitting in Marblehead. Marblehead happens to be the home or the birthplace of Elbridge Gerry. Everybody calls it Jerry, as in gerrymandering, but it's Gary. And if you live in Marblehead, you have to say Gary. And if you are <laughs> caught in Marblehead saying gerrymandering, you'll be kicked out of the pub. So basically, <laughs> Elbridge Gerry, who was the guy who took the lead in drafting the Massachusetts law, he lived just a mile from here. And uh, he knew very well about the power of privateering, as did John Adams. And they realized that uh, in the absence of a Continental Navy, which was yet to come into being and was very difficult to create, privateering was a way of having a cost-free Navy, in effect, a militia of the sea. It was the quickest and most effective way to whip up a maritime force that could not defeat the British Navy. That was never the goal. The goal was to annoy British commerce to such a degree that it would make it painful for Great Britain to continue this war. And also at the same time to bring goods and ships and munitions and prisoners into the colonies that would help bolster the colonial side of the war. So I, you know, I, I I, I did neglect at the beginning of the show to mention that I am drinking rum. I, I have my, my rum. Uh, my wife said I should have a tankard of rum, so I have a very tiny tankard. Tiny. Tankard. Thank tiny, you. Thank you for <laughs> Tiny tankard. So I wanted to make sure that I, 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 people didn't think I was forcing you guys to drink and then, and then uh, <laughs> not drinking myself. I'm going to take some of the questions from our audience, Chris. Um, Absolutely. And I'll, I'll do it in some of the order that they came in. I don't know if I can get to all of them, but let's start with Jim Latin. Uh, uh, and he wants to know, and you've sort of talked about Massachusetts, but where did privateers come from, northern or southern ports? Did we get southern privateers as well? Because those colonies are also on the seaboard. Not as many far south. I mean, Massachusetts was first, but Philadelphia was second. Uh, Rhode Island had quite a few privateers. Connecticut had a lot of privateers out of New London. Georgia, as far as we know, didn't have any privateers. North Carolina. I don't know, Virginia had some privateers, but as you went further south, the numbers diminished a little bit. New England was really leading the way. And I would argue that New England at the time of the American Revolution was the most uh, maritime centric part of the colonies with the exception of uh, New York. I mean, Philadelphia was up there, but New York, as you know, fell into British hands early on. And even though New York continued to exist as a colony and they sent out a few privateers and there was some there were a number of whaleboat privateers that came out of Connecticut. Uh, New York was really a source of British privateering throughout the American Revolution. And that's another fascinating part of the story that I talk about. And, and I just want to add one thing. You know, I've, I've I've written 15 books. I'm not a trained historian. I have an undergraduate degree, a master's and a Ph.D. in biology and environmental policy. Right. <laughs> I just always loved writing and I started writing books about history, which is what I really enjoyed. And uh, I always pick topics I don't know a lot about. And that's true about privateering in the American Revolution. The thing that got me interested in this topic was I wrote a book called Black Flags, Blue Waters, the epic history of America's most notorious pirates. And in that, there are a lot of privateers who were actually pirates in all but name. They acted like pirates. Uh, Blackbeard was a privateer in the War of the Spanish Succession, most likely. And after the war was over, he turned to piracy. During King William's War in the late 1600s, a lot of American quote unquote privateers went around the Cape of Good Horn, the, uh, Cape, Cape Hope, and they, uh, 
Cape Horn and Cape Good Hope, sorry. And they went into the Indian Ocean and they attacked Mughal shipping and they basically were privateers. So a lot of these pirates that had letters of mark, like Sir Francis Drake in an earlier era, they gave privateering a bad name. And whenever I gave a talk on this pirate book, people would ask me about privateering and whether privateers would just legalize pirates. And that got me thinking about, well, what happened during the American Revolution? I had heard a little bit about privateering and I started reading more and I realized that the privateers during the American Revolution were most definitely not pirates. But by telling the story of privateers, it would enable me to write a history that braided together a lot of the American Revolution, which is an era that I and many other people just love. I, a lot yeah. of my books have had chapters on the American Revolution. But this gave me an opportunity to focus directly on the American Revolution, to tie in privateering, which is something that I truly believe has been neglected in general histories of the American Revolution and in maritime histories, and bring something to people that was essentially new to them. I'm not saying it's completely new. There have been books that have talked a little bit about privateering, but I do believe that this is the first comprehensive narrative book on privateering in the American Revolution that really gives you all sides of the story. And I just want to add one last thing. George Washington, who is a great character in history, a great general, and a great observer of human nature and also the events of the day, he called the American Revolution that we won a standing miracle. And the reason that he did so is he realized that there were many different elements that went into the success of the American Revolution. It wasn't just his leadership. It wasn't the Continental Navy. It wasn't just France joining us as allies and Spain and all these other things. It was a whole bunch of things that had to happen. And if things hadn't happened quite as they did, we might very well have lost. And my argument essentially is not that privateering is the most important element. I don't think it is, but I think it is a critical element and very significant in contributing to the success of the war, especially in the early years when almost all the news was bad on land. So I just don't want people to focus on great generals, land battles, the French intervention. Right. There are other parts of the story that are equally exciting and I think just as important. And one last thing, I'm glad that I'm speaking to you now. And Chris, you're in London. Yes. I'm glad that, that we are not compatriots. I'm glad that the United States is around. But one thing that you can't, if you read about the American Revolution, anybody that's read a lot about the American Revolution, and I, I will now class myself in that group, has to realize that, boy, if those British just weren't so incredibly arrogant at the outset of the war, and if they hadn't pushed their advantage they should have won this thing handily yes. in the first year or two. But we were lucky, and we played a war of attrition. And as Nathaniel Green and Washington said, you know, we lost to come back and fight another day. So um, anyway, I, I love the, the story of the American Revolution, and I loved weaving the story of privateering into the overall narrative. So do you want to keep going? I, well, I just I, wish that our guest had a little more passion about his topic, Chris. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, well, just, I, that, I want, I want, that diffident I want, attitude is just really hard for me to deal with. I just insist that the next book be about the loyalist privateers, you know, the ones yes. that believe in good government and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Right. Yes. I'm well, I, I, here to help. I, do have, I do have a big section in the book about British privateers. That was one of my favorite sections and, in the book. It is fascinating. I mean... The, the British privateers that came out of New York, the ones that came out of England. And uh, there's a funny comment that James Fenimore Cooper makes, and that sort of gives you a sense of how important American privateers were, because American privateers captured British merchantmen who were stuffed to the gills with goods that Britain was still trading. British privateers and, um, and British, the Royal Navy, they captured a lot of American privateers but American privateers, for the most part, there are some exceptions, didn't have cargo on board. They were not that valuable as prizes. So what James Fenimore Cooper said is that out of England, they sent out their privateers essentially to recapture their own merchantmen and get that to get those goods back into England because it didn't pay to capture American privateersmen. 
There's one exception, though, and I have to make a distinction. There were two types of privateers. There were the straight privateers who were heavily armed and had a lot of men on board, and they solely went out to capture British ships. Then there were the letter of mark privateers. They both had letters of mark, but these other ones were actually called letter of mark privateers. And they were carrying on, they were commercial ships that had cargoes that were going to ports like Bilbao and Dunkirk. So they were intent on trading and selling their goods. But if along the way they saw a potential British prize, they could reach out, they could attack them and right. capture them and gain from the profits if they were able to send it back to port. So anyway, you know, yes, I'm a little passionate. I mean, every book I've written, I've been passionate about. I just really excited about the history. It's really fascinating to me. Right. And I'm hoping that the fascination that I had, you know, bleeds onto the page a little bit. Oh, it does. It does. I think it is. Yeah, Chris, you, you want to pick more up pages about the loyalists, though. More pages <laughs> about the loyalists. Yeah, Chris likes the Penobscot chapter. Yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah, let's talk about the because because that was okay. a glorious glorious moment in British arms, and as Rick has pointed out to me, wait it's, a second, uh, are you American was, or British? Well, I'm a, I'm a descendant of I'm, descendant, I'm a proud Tory. I'm a proud Tory. So you know, it's like the point counterpoint thing. You no, know, but actually, let's like we have we have so many questions here. Um, and let's just I'll just we'll just pick some. So uh, Brian Peacock. Um, had a question and he wants to know uh, were any of the privateers working in the Chesapeake because Brian's from that area and I would like to know I did not run across a lot of information about privateers working in Chesapeake Bay but there were a lot of privateers that would have come out of Chesapeake Bay okay. in various ports uh, they tended to work off the coast mostly uh, but but that being said I know that there were privateers that did attack in Chesapeake Bay I didn't focus a lot on it in yep. fact I think there's a book if I'm not mistaken, and I'm, I think I used it as a reference, I think there's a book called The Privateers of Chesapeake Bay. Oh, so okay. don't ask me. Go to that <laughs> go, book go to the book. Get information. Because one of the problems with writing a book that spans you know, seven or eight years and has to talk about all of privateering over 13 colonies is that I have a bird's eye view. And right. a lot of great stories that are important to people in individual colonies uh, or people who live now in individual individual states will not right. be you won't read you won't read about them I, I got this when i wrote a book about whaling i wrote a book called leviathan the history of whaling and i went to talk in sag harbor and new london and in my entire book which is almost 400 pages i only had a page and a half on whaling in sag harbor and new london which are very proud whaling right, town. Right. and they got upset at me but they still invited me there and i wrote a book on lighthouses and a lot of times I go to these places and I talk and I don't say a darn word about the lighthouse. It's a mile away from where I'm talking. And sometimes right. people got upset. One woman, I just say a quick story. One woman came to one of my talks in uh, Newburyport. She sat right in the front row and she said, my lighthouse book, Brilliant Beacons. Do you have anything about the Plum Island Lighthouse, which is nearby? And I said, no, you know, there are 1500 lighthouses. I only cover so so. And she said, right before I started my talk, in a bookstore, she said, "Well, I'm not buying your book. <laughs> okay, you don't have to buy my book." But I get this all the time. So, and I have gotten probably, I would say, close to 30 emails since this book came out, "Rebels right. at Sea," on May 31st, from people who have ancestors who were privateers, right. privateersmen, and they ask me, "Do I talk about them?" And right. of all those emails, and I've gotten even more posts on my Facebook page. There have only been two or three instances in which I was able to respond, yes, your your right. ancestors in there. And to their credit, the people who aren't don't have ancestors who are in there, they still say, Oh, maybe I'll still get your book. I, what I say is even if your ancestor's not in there, by reading this book, it'll give you more context to understand the great thing that your ancestor did. Well, so, you, can add, you can add to that and say, buy the book, and then you can see the bibliography in the back. It'll tell you all the other books that you can read about this. And right. so you're still, yeah, you're still yeah, selling the book. Other, yes. right. Absolutely. Here's another question. This one from Lynn Hargrove, and it's a, it's kind of a, it leads into a big area, I know. Did yeah. they take some of their prizes into French ports? Oh, yeah. That was, a big, that was a big part of the reason why France became our ally. From the very beginning, you know, France was giving us munitions. They were giving us money. 
there were treaties between Great Britain and France that specifically said that neither country could entertain privateers of any other country, and certainly not a country who was at war with one or the other. Well, France, from the very beginning, flouted that and allowed American privateers to go into ports like Martinique in the Caribbean and Dunkirk in France. And the British ambassador to France, Lord Stormont, was absolutely apoplectic about this, as was British Parliament. And there were there are, are newspaper accounts that I talk about in the book where people say in Britain that if France keeps entertaining American privateers, giving them uh, support, allowing them to sell their prizes in French ports, allowing them to take on board French sailors, we are going to have a war with France. Well, the and, and, with, and the Americans are all like, oh, goody. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what that's what Benjamin Franklin and, and Silas Dean and the other commissioners. That was their goal. It was explicitly stated from the Continental Congress. They were in France in part to use privateering as a wedge to create greater discord between France and Great Britain, and hopefully to get France to come in on the side of the Americans. Now, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. Privateering was not the main reason that France came in. The main reason was when the Americans beat General Johnny Burgoyne at the Battle of Saratoga in October of 1777, and finally convinced the French that the Americans could win this darn war. They didn't want to throw all in until they were convinced they were betting on a horse that might win. But if Saratoga hadn't occurred, and if the impact of privateering, American privateering on Britain had gotten even worse, who knows what would have happened? There may have been a declaration of war based on that. But Britain, I don't, I'm not sure, but Britain, they didn't want to declare war on France because they didn't want to turn this into a world, world war. France didn't want to declare war on Britain until they knew they were backing a winner. So basically the defeat, British defeat at Saratoga gave France the evidence they needed that maybe they could go all in and that plus the animus that was generated between Great Britain and France because of privateering created a context within which France became our allies. And I really believe that it played a role. You just have to read what Benjamin Franklin and these other people were saying while it was happening in real time. They thought that privateering was helping the American cause and hurting the relationship between France and Britain. And it absolutely was. So, Rick, I, well, actually, one the, I want to pick up another question that we got, and this is from um, Kathy. Um, here we go. It's, I'm surprised that the British recognized a letter of Mark from the colony since they didn't recognize us <laughs> as a legitimate country. And I would add on, add on yeah. to that question. That presents some interesting problems for the British when they capture privateers. That you talk about in the book so maybe maybe you could talk about how are the british handling this well they didn't recognize the letters of mark they didn't recognize yeah. any of the americans we were all rebels and you know rebelling revolution they didn't recognize us they certainly right. hated privateers they treated them as they didn't treat them as they thought they were pirates i mean they treated them worse than they treated continental navy sailors and officers but they viewed privateers as pirates even though they sent out their own privateers to fight against the americans the difference was the United States wasn't the United States. It was a bunch of colonies rebelling against the mother country. So right. they thought that we were pirates. But that created a real problem because they didn't want to recognize sovereignty of the colonies. So if the colonies weren't sovereign, they were still British citizens. And if they were British citizens and they were captured, the privateers, because of habeas corpus and the Constitution, they, the unwritten Constitution, they were to be brought before a court to be told what they were charged with and then tried. Well, Lord North didn't want to do that because you would clog up the courts and uh, you know cause great problems. And then you might have to hang some of these American privateersmen, even though they told them that they were gonna hang them, they never did because they realized that they started hanging American privateersmen, then the Americans would start hanging British soldiers uh, at you know tit for tat probably. So Lord North had a problem. And what they did is they created a new law that labeled privateers basically as engaging in treasonous activity on the open ocean 
and they could be thrown in jail for an indeterminate amount of time without being brought, a, brought before a court to have the charges against them read and, and have their day in court. So that's, that's what happened. And basically, because the British thought they were going to win the war so fast, they didn't really think about setting up prisons. And that's why the prison situation got so bad. Lord North at the beginning thought the war would be over in a year, maybe a year and a half. So even though people were concerned that they were basically eliminating privateersmen's right to habeas corpus, their right to a day in court and throwing them into jail for an indeterminate amount of time, Lord North's response was, don't worry, it's only temporary. In a year and a half, we'll have beaten them. They'll be our fellow citizens again, and we'll deal with it come what may. Well, that didn't work out quite that way, and we got overcrowding in the prisons, especially in the colonies, and just horrific conditions where probably tens of thousands, or certainly more than 10,000 Americans died on these prison ships. Um, we, but, but I want to add, I want to add yeah, one more oh, yeah, thing. Go ahead. And this is, this is a complicating factor. Letters of Mark were established in the 13th century in Europe. They were used extensively. There was a international law relating to letters of Mark. It was during times of war, a sovereign nation could use it to sort of amplify their power upon the seas. The problem is the Americans weren't a sovereign nation. So technically, could we issue letters of Mark? Well, probably not really. But if you want to argue about that, that's fine. In the end, whether you think they could or they couldn't, they did. And privateers had the impact that I outline in the book. There's a great line in the novel Shogun where the where the Japanese uh, leader says there is absolutely no excuse, justifiable excuse at all for rebelling, and the uh, and, and and the uh, Englishman he's talking to says unless you win, he says yes, <laughs> that's the one exception to that rule. That's true. <laughs> um, we might as well keep uh, on. We have so many people in the audience asking questions. It certainly makes our life easier, uh, uh, Chris. Uh, and I just uh, was looking down for one. Uh, so Frank has a question here. Um, uh, did Lloyds of London, or if Lloyds of London wasn't around, somebody, cover the losses of British merchant ships due to privateering? Yes, uh, Lloyds of London was definitely around. And yes, many of the losses were, in fact, covered. I mean, I don't want to blow this out of proportion. According to Lloyds of London, about 8% of their ships were captured during the American Revolution. There is no way to argue that America crippled England during the war. Great Britain could have continued the American Revolution for another 5, 10, 15 years if they had wanted to. It would have been painful, but they could have. After the war was over, Great Britain was still the most powerful country around. And of course, they quickly returned to commerce with their former colonies, and they had a great time of it. We didn't have as good of a time in the near term. So essentially, yes, a lot of the losses were covered but that still didn't make them not painful. Uh, there are ancillary losses. There are prisoners. There are just the fact that your fleet has been- Insurance defeated. rates go up, right? Insurance rates went up a lot. And uh, so so it wasn't, it wasn't just a zero sum game. Uh, basically, there was real pain being felt in England, especially because a lot of Englishmen, even though they didn't like the Americans rebelling, and they sort of looked down on the Americans. A lot of them, especially the merchant class, realized that the colonies were a great place to trade. And their attitude was, well, if they're not going to be part of our country, let's get this over with and get back to trading with them once again so we can make money. <laughs> so, is it my turn or whose turn is it? Yeah, it's your turn. Uh, well, Eric, one of the things, again, lots... There were so many things in this book that I hadn't really thought about and that were really fascinating. But one of the kind of other things that you touch on uh, is is the privateer's impact on the slave trade. Uh, oh yeah. And and I think that's something that an issue that should be raised. And and I'd be curious if you could just kind of briefly touch on that. You know? Yeah, I mean there there's a lot of ways. There were a lot of black men. I think we have a picture of James Fortin. He was a 14 year old black free black teenager in Philadelphia who uh, signed on to the Royal Lewis, a privateer out of Philadelphia, and had a very interesting time of it. There were a lot of enslaved individuals who ran away from their owners. 
to sign up for privateers. There were also a lot of owners who would rent out their enslaved individuals as a money-making scheme. But to answer your question more directly, a lot of American privateers were operating off the west coast of Africa and in the Caribbean, and they picked off a lot of British slave ships. So what did they do with those slaves? The Americans didn't emancipate the slaves. They took them to slave marts in the colonies and in the Caribbean and sold them. So in effect, a number of privateers became slave traders, but they had an interesting impact. There's a great book that just came out by Christian McBurney called Dark Voyage that talks about this very issue. And he was very helpful to me in working on my book because I didn't know as much about it as he did. And one of the things that he points out is that the impact of the American privateers on the slave trade was dramatic. In fact, so many slavers, British slavers were captured that in Great Britain, they decided not to engage in the slave trade at as high a level as they normally did throughout the course of the American Revolution. And as a result, the number of people taken forcibly, black people taken forcibly from Africa during the American Revolution dropped precipitously. Of course, after the American Revolution was over, it ramped right up. But that's a fascinating sort of byproduct of privateering by causing British slave merchants to decide they should not be engaged in slave traffic right now because there was too much of a risk of their ships getting captured by American privateers. It actually resulted in tens of thousands of black men and women and children not being dragged into the slave trade during the war. You know, there was a there was a, a a a little tiny thing you wrote in passing that caught my eye, and I wanted to ask you about Don't it. Don't tell me that because I I have a lot of stories about tiny sentences in books that somebody else, another author, wrote read and said, "Wow, let's turn that into a book," and they turn it into a best selling book, and you missed it. So what, what is this? <laughs> Well, I, I don't think this is one of those. <laughs> you said when Congress laid down the privateering legislation that they mandated that one third of the crews oh, right. be landsmen, right. people not trained as sailors. And I thought, OK, is this just the an early version of the U.S. Congress engaged in bizarre bureaucratic overreach? What's what no, no, is no. the purpose of that? No, no, it was a great fear. They knew, people knew because they had experience of privateering that a lot of men would choose to be privateers rather than go into the Continental Navy because the prospects for making more money are a little bit greater. So they wanted to tamp down on the number of men jumping on to privateers by mandating that one third of all the men on privateers be landsmen. Now, we don't know if that one-third stipulation actually played out on the, the ships. I mean, somebody that is far more patient than I am and could dig deeper into the records might be able to get a good <laughs> bead on that. But I doubt it. I doubt that there was compliance with that. There was certainly no over-enforcement of that. But nevertheless, there were a lot of men who had never been to sea who did jump on to privateers because they wanted to make money. We have a lot of accounts of them. And there are funny there are funny accounts of men going to sea. They were formerly farmers or laborers on, on land. And they have to learn the language of the ship. They have to deal with seasickness. I mean, this is very common in the whaling industry as well. There were a lot of men who had never been to sea that jumped on the opportunity to be on a whaling ship. And for the first couple of months, it was a particularly difficult experience. Anybody that's ever been on a boat at sea, even a sailboat or a motorboat, and you engage, in, you have some rough weather, you know, seasickness is, you have to take a while to get used to it. I've been on a number of boats where I've never thrown up, but I've come close. Going out of Chatham once, Chatham Harbor on a fishing vessel, and right outside of the bar, it was in thick, thick fog. You couldn't see 10 feet in front of you, and the rollers were about eight feet from top to trough and we were going up 
and down. And the captain was just talking to me like it was a day in the park. <laughs> and I was not talking because I was trying hard not to throw up. <laughs> I like the story you had in the book of the of the sea captain who put the water pump at the top of the mast oh, yeah. so that the landsman <laughs> who had never climbed up the mast where if you wanted to drink any water, you were going to have to walk, go all the way up to the top of the mast. But I'm yes. jumping in, Chris. It is your turn. No, no, no. It, uh, well, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It, <laughs> you've touched us on this a bit, but again, one of the things I found interesting was the impact of privateering on Britain's morale and Britain's willingness to sustain the war. You know, you had mentioned earlier that if the British had had the willpower, they could have kept the war going after Yorktown for 5, 10, 15 years, however long it took. Right. Um, but you talk a bit about how the, this privateering effort really impacted morale and the willingness to of Britons to sustain the fight. And maybe you could right. kind of right. talk about I mean, that a bit. Well, it's, it's part of an overall narrative. I mean, Brit it wasn't just privateering. Right. It was the losses at Yorktown, at Saratoga. It was the number of prisoners that Americans took. That was a little bit of a problem in England, the way they viewed it. They weren't treated as poorly as American prisoners in British prisons. But it was just the dragging out of this event, the tamping down on the trade between Great Britain and their sugar islands in the Caribbean. And you have to keep in mind the trade, the value of trade between the Caribbean and Great Britain was greater than the value of trade between Great Britain and its American colonies. Right. So the fact that American privateering, as well as attacks by continental Navy vessels, I don't want to diminish the Continental Navy completely. I don't think they had as great of an impact as the privateers did, but they did have some success. But essentially, the problems in the Caribbean that Great Britain encountered and the plummeting of the value of their trade was a much greater concern to them than the loss of the colonies, in a sense, right. because it meant more monetarily. So uh, privateering was one of many things that was nibbling away at the British economy and British resolve. And ultimately, when Yorktown came about, you know, after that, it was such a it was such a massive and signal and embarrassing defeat that the war dragged on for a number more years. There were more battles down south. There were a lot of people yet to die. But for all intents and purposes, and I'm not the only person to say this, right. a lot of historians have said this, and I think it's really true. For all intents and purposes, after the Battle of Yorktown, the war was winding down. Britain was pissed off. And they were like an upset, I don't know, I don't know what the word is. They were sort of like a big bully who got a bloody nose. And they didn't know quite what to do. And they started these negotiations and they lasted a long time because there were a lot of things they had to work out. And Britain was trying to angle for the best possible result. So were the Americans. And in the background, there's this battling going on. And it's fascinating. This is not something I spend a lot of time on in the book. And to be honest, I'm not an expert on this part of the war. But from September of 17, September, October of 1781 through the final Treaty of Paris in September of 1783, I know there have been books written about it. It's really a strange sort of quasi, it's not a quasi war, it's a war, but it's sort of like a quasi war. It's this strange interlude where people are still dying. There's still battles, especially down south. But the people in power sort of know that it's it's over. It's right. it's not a question of 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 if. It's it's when. And it's, it's this very moved strange on. time. Yeah. 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 Um, we, we haven't talked too much about the individual. Uh, privateers, and we're coming near the end of our show. And I thought maybe we could we could talk about one. And he's the person you open uh, the oh, the right. book with. Uh, and uh, and I know uh, a pretty bold fellow named Jonathan Harridan, who fights a, a pretty amazing action just off the coast of Spain. And uh, maybe you could you know, we'll use him as a maybe not typical, but at least illustrative of uh, of privateers. Tell us a little bit about yeah. about him and what he was involved in. Yeah, I mean, Jonathan Harridan was from Salem. Uh, he was originally from Gloucester, but he spent time in Salem. He signed on to a Navy vessel, appropriately enough, called the Tyrannicide, uh, which uh, he had a dispute over pay. He left the, the state Navy vessel, Tyrannicide, and he went on to uh, 
head up a number of privateers, but the most important of which was the Pickering out of Salem. And he captured many British prizes, brought back many British prisoners, cannons, and ships. But the story that I start out with, it's interesting because it's not actually a victory, really. He doesn't capture the prize, but it was such an out-of-balance battle that he did well in that it was deserving of my attention and of attention of the people of the day. Basically, he was heading to Bilbao in 1780, and he was on the letter of Mark privateer. He Which was is in Spain, trade. Bilbao. Spain, right. Bilbao, Spain. He was going to trade, and along the way, he captured a golden eagle, which is a uh, not a golden eagle, the golden eagle, a British uh, British merchant ship. And uh, then right off the coast of Bilbao, he ran into the Achilles, which was a British uh, privateer, a very big ship. You have to keep in mind that uh, the Pickering and uh, Harridan, he had 38 men on board and he had 16 cannons. The Achilles had 143 men on board and 43 cannons, mm. much, much bigger. But Harridan didn't run. He knew he was going to fight this ship. And he went to sleep that night because they weren't going to battle his night. And he told his men to uh, wake him up the next morning if the Achilles started to approach. The next morning, the Achilles starts to approach. His men wake him up. He comes up. He realizes that he is at a deficit in many ways, but he's got a bunch of British prisoners on board. So he tells them if any of them step forward and fight with the Americans, they can get a percentage of the prize money. So 10 British sailors step forward oh sorry chris and uh and uh <laughs> and then so his complement is up to 48 and uh the battle begins it lasts for two hours one of his men said that harridan was as calm as if it was a shower of snowflakes but there's musket fire there's cannonballs flying through the air and finally harridan decides to fill his cannons with bar shot which is essentially two cannonballs that are connected by an iron bar. And when they exit the cannon, they spin wildly and they can shred sails and rigging and they can destroy a mast or a spar if they hit it dead on. So this was too much for the Achilles to take. They had, they had, they had uh, absorbed a lot of damage. They turned and ran. Harridan chased them, but he wasn't fast enough to capture the Achilles. It got away. The Golden Eagle, which the Achilles had captured earlier on, was returned, uh, Harrod and recaptured it. But the thing that's kind of neat is this is right off Bilbao, Spain, which is a very big port at the time. And people heard that there was going to be this massive battle offshore. So about a thousand people came to the beach to watch the British and the American fight. And after the battle was over, when Harrod and went into port, he was treated like a, a royal victor, like a, you know, a king. And uh, the men said that he could barely touch the ground. He was raised aloft and he was feted and he was there for two months. He resupplied. He went back to Salem, back to Salem, true to form. Harridan captured three more British merchant ships, sent them back to Salem. And when he finally returned to Salem, the owners of the Pickering were so proud of their intrepid captain that they gave him a silver tankard and two identical silver mugs etched with the image of the Pickering and his initials. And I think, did I send those to you? Oh, I don't think I sent those to you. I don't so, have that. I have the plaque. Oh, yeah. oh, the plaque. Now, this is the good story to end on. Show the plaque. This plaque, while I was working on the book, I read that there was this plaque. This is the top third of a plaque that was sort of honoring Harridan's battle with the Achilles. Now, it's said that it was on the side of a house in Salem. So this is during COVID. I got on my bike, Marblehead's next to Salem. I biked over. I looked near the witch house, which is where it was supposed to have been, and I couldn't find it. So I went back home and I called a local Salem historian and I said, where is this plaque? And she said, well, you've got to get ready for this. The plaque, you know where the plaque was? The plaque was in a nearby Korean barbecue restaurant. As it, as it would be, yeah. As it would be, and nobody knows, nobody knows how it got put there. It was put on the side of a house that Harridan lived at, lived on, lived in, in 1909. So it's an old plaque, and it's very big. So I go to this Korean barbecue <laughs> place, I walk in, 
the woman there is very excited because it's during COVID and she has no customers and she thought I was there to order food. But I told her, sorry, I'm here to see that. And right behind the cash register is this enormous plaque. Jeez. How it got there, nobody knows, but I think that it's the perfect emblem of how American privateering during the American Revolution has been treated by history books. It's sort of shunted off to the side and it's along with spicy wings. I don't know. <laughs> you know so I just thought but, that was a great story. <laughs> but, but now that you've had a chance to talk about this on History Happy Hour, you know, things will Everybody change. Does. Everybody, Everybody will know does. about it. I, I, I hope so. I, I've got a, very, a lot of really gratifying feedback from readers, you know, who've just said, I never knew about this. I right. gave a talk at Nant on Nantucket last week, and somebody in the audience said, I know a lot about the American Revolution. How come I've never heard about this? Yeah, yeah. And I, we have a way to find out. <laughs> Eric Dolan, thank you so much thank for so much, joining Eric. us You're today. Uh, and uh, I just want to remind people that the book that we have been talking about, uh, a terrific book, Rebels at Sea, Privateering in the American Revolution by Eric J. Dolan. And thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So I want to say, hey, we're back live, except we're, we're live. not live, no, no. but we're back in virtual February 2022 land. Yes, yes. We're back in the current day. Our time travel has ended. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> still old, still gray. <laughs> yeah, nothing, nothing really fixes that. Changed. And next week, Chris, we're going to bring back uh, Peter Hart, uh, who's been on the show from your side of the pond there. And this time he's going to be with his co-author, Gary Bain, from Pete and Gary's podcast, and talking about their new book, Laugh or Cry, The British Soldier on the Western Front, 1914 to 1918. I'm excited to dive into it and uh, uh, bring it to everybody next week. There you go. So, start so, reading. Yeah, so thanks everybody for joining us. Make sure thanks you uh, check out our website, uh, historyhappyhour.com, and subscribe to YouTube and Facebook, History Happy Hour, because God knows we just need those extra subscribers to boost our ego. And also, then you That's get right. to like find out what's coming up. There we go. Thanks yeah. for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Be safe.